Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. David Potter. He is Francis W. Kelsey Collegiate Professor of Greek and Roman History and Arthur F. Thorno Professor at the University of Michigan. And today we're going to talk about his new book, Disruption, Why Things Change. So, Dr. Potter, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Okay, so let's start perhaps with a basic question. What do you mean by disruption in the context of your book and from a historical perspective? Okay, what I mean by disruption is really a fundamental change in the way a society is organized, a change that makes of the sort that makes it impossible to go back to the way that things were before the change happened. Sometimes this is a thoroughly good thing, um, or at least it can be a very successful thing. And at other times, it can be thoroughly destructive. I think the creation of the U.S. Constitution is a very good example of the way that things could work out in a positive way. And it really was a remarkable thing to suddenly create a strong national government on the basis of political theory that had never been tried before. Uh, but if you look at the Bolshevik re Revolution or Hitler's rise to power, um, those are stellar examples of disruptions gone wrong, or the entire career of Robespierre. Um, the course that things take is going to be influenced by the choices that people make. And I think uh, one of the points I really want to bring out in, the, in my work is that whatever the underlying factors are, there are still choices that people are going to make that are going to determine the outcome. There is no such thing as an inevitable outcome to a set of circumstances. Right. And are revolutions specifically disruptions? Are they all disruptions? Are some of them not? Uh, how does it work exactly? That's a really good question. Uh, the events we often call revolutions can be disruptions. And of course, a number of the ones I talk about in my book uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, the U.S. Revolution, the French Revolution, um, but those are also things that also re resulted in a thorough transformation uh, of social and intellectual direction. Uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, if you look at the so-called you know, revolutions of 1848, maybe with Karl Marx sneer sneering on the side, uh, those were not disruptions. Uh, very often, we can see changes that don't amount to a thorough um, alteration of, dire uh, of direction. I mean, we look at the, for instance, the revolution the China, in China in the 1940s, that's really a struggle between two entities, uh, both originally funded from Moscow, for control of a failed state. Is That's not really going to be... Uh, a disruption in the same way that we're talking about. Um, the same way they say the French Revolution destroyed the alliance between the nobility and the church uh, that had supported the monarchy since the Middle Ages. Um, it was an event that meant that society was going to move into a new direction and couldn't go back again. Uh, the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity, uh, where one system of thought uh, was millennia old, was replaced by a new one. Uh, was again something from which there was no real turning back. Um, and the one effort to do so when the Emperor Julian said, okay, we're all going to be pagans again, most pagans wished he would shut up at that point. So that's maybe the best sign of a successful disruption. Right. Uh, we will get into some of those disruptions later on in the interview and get into some of it, their details. But f before that, do we know what are the factors that play a role in disruptions? Uh, these can arise from quite a wide variety of factors. Uh, defeat in war is one, environmental catastrophe, economic inequity, uh, general contempt for the inefficiency of government, government seen not to actually function the way it ought to do. Um, when we're looking at a really radical disruption, uh, it's usually going to be a combination of factors that convince people that their institutions are simply not working for them. Uh, the traditional political society has ceased to function. Um, people are, you know, are questioning their uh, traditional beliefs. Right. But do we know what causes disruptions? I mean, is it 
uh, ideas, the conditions people live in, the sort of political, economic, social context? What exactly? Um, I think it's really a, co a combination of the two. Uh, without, a f a, uh, without a sense of failure, of course, uh, there isn't going to be a big demand for radical change. Um, and it's that sense of failure that uh, makes it possible for new ideas to gain uh, currency. Uh, you can have a big failure, of course, that doesn't end in a major disruption. Um, we can look at the different impacts of the Great Depression um, in the United States, which gives rise to the New Deal, uh, and in Germany in the 1930s. Things go in totally different directions because of the choices that people make. But in, you know, in the case of the New Deal, the idea that government was really going to be there for people and put them to work, and that was its responsibility, uh, was a uh, was really very radical in the, in the wake of the sort of laissez-faire capitalist attitudes of uh, earlier uh, presidential uh, regimes. Uh, so, um, I think less encouraging. I think uh, would be something like the failure of the Soviet Union, which really changed very little. <laughs> yeah, uh, but when disruptions occur, do they always bring about new ways of organizing society, new political regimes, or not? They do not necessarily bring about a new political regime. They can result in a radical change in thinking. I mean, say the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity, yeah, you still had a Roman emperor. But what he had was a new ideological system supporting him. We look at the Protestant Reformation. You still had states ruled by princes um, and kings, but you had a new way of interpreting the world around you. Um, you know, again, a very different uh, sort of thing would be the French Revolution uh, or the framing of the U.S. Constitution, uh, where you both change this, a set of ideas and you change the political organization to go with it. Yeah, but I mean, are there traits that all disruption share or do we have to look at them uh, on a case by case basis and look at sort of the traits that each of them have? Um, I think that first and foremost, there is the, the failure of central institutions, um, the lack of confidence in, in institutions. Um, then I think you have to look at the presence of individuals with the imagination to move society in a new direction. Uh, the presence of a cadre of people who are looking to organize change is crucial here. And I realize this sounds uh, maybe a bit like Lenin on a bad day, uh, but you know, he had a point uh, when he said that uh, uh, you need a really tight organization to make a disruption change. And if we look at the really successful disruptions uh, over time, we can see there's a tight, -knit, knit group of people that are moving something, uh, moving things in, in a new direction. Um, I think it's very interesting that, uh, of course, Lenin was looking at the French Revolution and saying, okay, they got that one wrong, got that one wrong, got that one wrong. <laughs> so, but when do, is there a moment when we know that establish, established institutions have become a problem and we have to try to change them? I think there is. Um, it's when they cease to uh, serve the interests of society as a whole. And I think, frankly, uh, certainly uh, these days, and this is why I uh, wrote the book, uh, initially, it was watching what was going on in this country in 2017 onwards. Um, these are points when institutions of government seem to be frozen in place and incapable of dealing with the impact uh, of uh, what's going on around them. I mean, in this case, we could say dealing with the impact of surveillance capitalism, which has brought about a situation where the majority of people are seeing no improvement in their lives, uh, that uh, their standards of living, their jobs are, are vanishing, uh, and they're turning to fringe conspiracies uh, because they have no faith in government. Uh, this is the same kind of thing, of course, we saw in Germany uh, in the 1930s or France in the 1780s. Uh, government could not change itself to meet new circumstances. And I think this is a 
challenge that we share on both sides of the Atlantic. How can government uh, liberal democracy start working in the interests of the average person? Right. So let's talk now about specific disruptions that you talk about in the book and let's try to follow them in a chronological order. So starting with Constantine and the adoption of Christianity as the dominant religion in the Roman Empire, uh, what happened there specifically? Uh, why do you call it a disruption and what were the sorts of t changes that it brought with it? Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that Constantine is an absolutely fascinating character. He's completely outside of the line of succession until a cabal of senior officers decided that they needed a figurehead when his father died. Uh, so they're not going to be tossed out of their jobs by the heir apparent. Uh, they'd watch this happen to colleagues of theirs further south and said, that's not going to happen to us. Um, this seems like a nice young man. Uh, but Constantine was absolutely nobody's puppet. Uh, he kept reshaping his image to meet new challenges. Uh, as an outsider, he was drawn to outsiders, I think. Uh, we know that he surrounded himself with a very tight-knit group of advisors on both the political and the uh, intellectual sides of things throughout his reign. I think we can be pretty sure that he didn't know very much about Christian doctrine uh, when he decided to become a Christian in 312. In fact, uh, a few years after that, he wrote a letter to some bishops. It's the only actual account of Constantine's conversion we have when he said, well, yeah, I was figuring, I was trying, trying to figure out what was wrong with me as a person. How could I be a better person? So I found the God who lives in the watch post of heaven, and I decided I'd go talk to him. Um, it's, a, it's a great story. Uh, but he saw, I think, that Christianity had a potential for empire-wide organization that no other religious group did. Um, Christianity, because it's based in the story of the life of Christ, is not bound to a single place the way most pagan cults were. Uh, there are a couple of alternatives uh, that could have been made to do the same thing, but Christianity was also the religion of the people whose vision of government Constantine uh, was replacing had absolutely despised. They'd been uh, persecutors of Christianity. Uh, Constantine himself had seen religious persecution up close, and he knew it didn't work. Uh, he knew it couldn't change the way that people thought, and he realized that he had to incentivize uh, rather than compel conversion. Um, he wanted to show that the old and the new could coexist. I mean, you know, okay, no more animal sacrifice, but, you know, okay, want to pray to Zeus, fine, that's, that's your business. Um, and I think he's a classic example of a, uh, of a sort of radical centrist as a person who creates a new and completely different area for discussion to move things forward. Yeah, but with the rise of Christianity within the Roman Empire, I mean, did it bring about any specific social and political changes with it or what? Well, it did offer a radically different uh, vision of the way that society uh, should be organized from that which was typical in the ancient world. Uh, social organization in antiquity involved a great deal of top-down uh, benefaction from the rich. I mean, the famous line uh, of the Roman satirist juveniles, so long as they've got breads and bread and circuses, they're all going to be fine. Uh, there was a, a sense that the, uh, you know, you keep the poor uh, happy and keep them in their place. Uh, Christianity said that anybody could obtain moral improvement and was equal in the eyes of God. I mean, a pagan cult was very he heavily stratified. You know, important people, okay, you get to talk to God. Poor people, okay, stand out there and listen to what you're being told. It's not open to everybody in the same way. Uh, we see that paths of advancement are opened up to people who simply would not have had those opportunities uh, in the path uh, through Christianity. Uh, the idea that anybody could obtain uh, moral improvement and that all people were equal in the eyes of God, that would have made somebody like the philosopher Seneca choke on his oysters. Um, there's a wonderful book uh, from the late second century uh, about a woman named Thecla who throws aside all the bonds of conventional society. She says, okay, I'm not going to get married. I listened to Paul. This sounded interesting. You know, off I go. Now, first thing that happens is her mother wants her burnt at the stake for uh, violating the norms of society. You know, she gets rescue, rescued by a few miracles on the way, goes off to a new place. Rich guy comes up to her and says, oh, how about, you know, wouldn't you like to go to bed with me? And she said, you know, uh, you know, 
uh, and he says, okay, we're going to throw you to the lions. You know, she escapes from the, the lions, the man-eating seals, all these other monstrous things. Uh, and finally, people at the end like, recognize that she's moved by a, a new sort of power within her and that they should let her go do her own thing. Um, that's a that sort of idea uh, that people from any walk of society can become significant through their piety uh, was a radical change. Uh, the idea that you could take the revolution, sort of revelation of a fringe group and turn it into the governing ideology of the empire also was a really radical, radical change. Right. But Christianity, was it something that resonated uh, with Roman society in general because of the conditions people lived in back then? Or was it some sort of a top-down thing that was... I mean, I, I, I didn't want to use the word imposed, but I mean, something along those lines. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, I, it did actually resonate uh, quite a lot with people because it was seen as a sort of countercultural move. Uh, if you'd lived in the Roman Empire in the life of Constant, in time of Constantine, you'd seen 50 years of failure before that. And if you go through the uh, list of emperors from 230 uh, onwards, you know, it's you know, murdered, killed by his men, assassinated, captured by the Persians, uh, etc. The economy of the empire had uh, collapsed in the latter part of the third century. What Constantine was doing was sort of trying to attach a reconstruction of Roman society with a new ideology. At the time that Constantine uh, became emperor, I don't know, maybe five or ten percent of the people in the empire were Christian. Uh, Fifty years later, um, it would have been sixty or seventy percent of people. Uh, but part of that was the notion that you get to choose. And Constantine was very clear about that. Uh, the temples aren't going to be closed, but here's a nice church. Uh, which would you like? The new church or old temple? <laughs> okay, so now moving on to another religion, one of the other major religions, Islam. So how was the life of Muhammad and how did Islam arise and why was it so successfully spread? across the world. Well, Muhammad's career is absolutely fascinating. And in recent years, we've come to uh, understand some very important things about the Quran itself. Um, it used to be believed that it was uh, edited and assembled well after the lifetime of Muhammad. And now we have two copies of the Quran from Muhammad's own lifetime, so that we know that if we want to get at his thought as it really was, uh, we go to the Quran. Um, there are some later biographies uh, of, uh, of Muhammad, but uh, mostly what they do is they can flesh out for us the context of uh, individual passages uh, in the Quran. Uh, we know that, again, he was somebody who was uh, living at a time of a great deal of uh, of change, uh, where central institutions uh, were collapsing. Uh, we can see that he was an extraordinary charismatic character. Uh, at times we can watch him lead. I think my favorite passage in the Quran uh, is when he says <coughs> uh, that uh, people should not flee uh, when the messenger of God is telling them to do something else. And there's clearly been a bad moment on the battlefield here uh, at one point. Or there's another passage uh, where he says that he wished that uh, people would stop making so much noise outside his chamber. Uh, so you know, as I said, we can sort of get at, I think, a feeling of this uh, extraordinary uh, person. Uh, the ideas that he was working with were largely present um, in Arabian society at his time. I mean, he drew uh, very heavily from you know, contact with Judaism, uh, with Christianity. Uh, he was rejecting traditional pagan cult. But as he said, you know, uh, I am the most recent messenger of God. This is the latest, the updated message, uh, and this is what we're going to do. Um, I don't think he thought that um, out, within a few years of his death, the Roman and Persian empires were going to disappear. Um, 
I think, you know, there's one passage uh, where he notices the Persian conquest of uh, Jerusalem in the 620s. Uh, and he said, that's okay, the Romans are going to come back. Uh, he'd done a lot of business with the Roman Empire. Uh, he didn't like the Persians at all. Uh, but the idea that his revelation uh, would fuel a movement that would destroy uh, the Persian and Roman empires as he'd seen them, I think, uh, was outside of his own expectation at the time that he died. Mm -hmm. But can we say that Muhammad was essentially a political figure, a religious figure, or both? He was really both. He was obviously uh, believed that he was in contact with God, uh, with the supernatural. I mean, the first uh, a vision, he talks about the, the, the night journey, uh, so that, yes, he um, very much uh, sees himself as delivering the latest message, but he's also a very clear political leader. Uh, you know, the Constitution of Medina, uh, where he lays out the terms under which his community is going to be interacting with other communities in the area is very clear um, sign of his abilities as a political leader. Uh, his takeover of uh, Central Arabia uh, as he moves out uh, from Medina to uh, reconquer Mecca. This is a very carefully organized uh, political process. Uh, so he had you know, great abilities, uh, both as a charismatic uh, religious leader and as a politician. We don't see people like that every day. <laughs> but uh, Islam spread very quickly from the Middle East to North Africa to uh, Southern, Western Europe. So are there any explanations for why that happened? The first thing is the thorough collapse of faith in the existing political order. Um, the Roman and Persian empires had been uh, facing each other for 600 years. Uh, but you had a period of bubonic plague in the middle of the 6th century with enormous loss of life. Uh, that had slowed down economic life. Uh, it had broken connections, trade routes, etc. Uh, so people were doing a lot less well. But then the solution on the part of the Roman and Persian empires, you know, if we're not doing very well, what do we do? Well, we'll try to rob our neighbor. Uh, and uh, you have uh, a short period of warfare at the end of the 6th century where the Romans are successful, and then in a period of Roman chaos, the Persians invade. There's a, a war of more than 20 years, uh, which the Romans, well, the Persians lose. It's a little hard to say that the Romans win. Uh, and then the Roman Emperor Heraclius does about everything he can possibly do to alienate uh, his subjects as he's trying to sort of reintegrate them into his empire. Uh, he is a religious extremist, uh, so he's trying to force one brand of Christianity uh, down the throats of other of people who really don't like it. He persecutes the Jewish community. Uh, he marries his niece, which was um, not generally approved of either. Uh, he, you know, one of the things that set off the Arab conquest uh, was he cut out the funding that was provided to pay the tribes of Northern Arabia not to attack the Roman Empire. Uh, so, and then in, on the Persian side, uh, the king who had been responsible for all these wars was overthrown and executed by his subjects. And then you have a group of successors, uh, which at the end of which you've got a child on the throne of Persia uh, being supported by a cabal of nobles, which isn't a very good way of uh, of organizing any kind of resistance to a new force. Uh, so what happens is the Arab armies start coming out of uh, northern Arabia and they're successful as one success builds on another and there are not the resources in Persia or the Roman Empire to resist them. Uh, but, uh, the spread of uh, Islam uh, to the Atlantic follows the lines of Roman provinces. Uh, the spread of Islam through Iran and Iraq follows the, the administrative structure uh, of the earlier Persian Empire. Uh, it's, but people uh, surrender. To, they don't even recognize necessarily there's a new religious order because there really wasn't until Abd al-Malik 
said, okay, you know, we need to bring some order to this. Uh, and so what you have is really two phases of reform. You know, the initial uh, movement with Muhammad and then Abdel Malik saying, this is now going to become a governing ideology for us. Uh, we've had a period of civil war. How do we stop this? How do we bring people together? We're going to bring people together around the revelation of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that uh, could it be the case that Islam was particularly uh, a um, religious ideology that attracted people easily to its cause or not? Yes, I think it did because you could have some different stages or phases of, of membership. It's again sort of very similar to what Constantine had done. Uh, you are a person of the book, but you don't have to be a, a practicing Muslim. You know, that's much better than being a pagan. Uh, but um, there's a, a, a range of connection with the community uh, that allows people, again, to make their own choices. And I think that one of the really critical things that we have to understand about the success of Christianity in the time of Constantine, the success of Islam in the wake of Muhammad, is that people are making choices to do this. It's not being run down. They're not being forced into something. Um, I, one could wish that some religious leaders nowadays recognized that <laughs> success in the past is not what they're doing now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, going back to Christianity and the Roman Empire, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, did Christianity also had some sort of influence in terms of how Europe got politically organized? Absolutely, because the church uh, basically controlled the educational institutions. You couldn't have a state without people uh, who could read and write. Uh, and so the sort of basic functionaries of government uh, are going to be uh, in the, uh, the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries are largely going to be people who are also in holy orders. Uh, the church also is a major landholder in every kingdom in Europe. Uh, so you, know, you can't avoid dealing with a centralized, the only central organization is the church, which is important because of the extensive landholding and because of its role in, in shaping who's, who's in government. Also, because of the church calendar, this is the only institution which is actually in contact with the average person on a daily and on a weekly basis. Um, so uh, at a number of different levels, uh, the church is providing a pretty fundamental organization. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Roman Empire, was it an extension of the Western Roman Empire or should we understand it differently? We should understand it very differently. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire comes into existence uh, initially in the wake of the reign of Charlemagne. There's no continuity with the Western Empire. Uh, much of the territory of the Holy Roman Empire was actually the land that Ro the Roman Empire never controlled uh, you know, in, in Central Europe, uh, areas north of the Rhine, um, about the only part of the Holy Roman Empire uh, before the reign of Charles V, which therefore included Spain and portions of Italy, um, that was part of the traditional Roman Empire with, with, the, with the Low Countries, uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, but otherwise, it is very much a German institution uh, north of the Rhine. Um, and of course, uh, that led to a great deal of difficulty uh, with an emperor who's trying to constantly negotiate his own authority uh, with these different states that make up the, the Holy Roman Empire. Um, I mean, I like to think what Constantine would have done if he'd come back to Earth and started wandering around and uh, here they elect the emperor? You must be kidding! <laughs> and I, it's, uh, it's a, a totally different organization. Yeah. Okay, so then we get into the Protestant Reformation. What led to it? There are a lot of factors here. I think the first thing is new technology. Uh, the invention of the printing press, uh, which makes it possible to spread information uh, vastly more effectively and more rapidly than it had been done in the past. Uh, I think that this enhanced the impact of the rediscovery 
of classical texts um, outside the bounds that were imposed by the church. Uh, and it popularized communication in languages other than Latin. All of a sudden, you're, you're in Germany. Oh, my, this is in German. I can read this. This is in English. I can, uh, I can read this. I mean, the, um, uh, so new technology. Uh, another is, again, going to be loss of faith in institutions. You have the rise of the Ottoman Empire in the East, the fall of Constantinople. A question, can anybody stop this new power uh, that is uh, moving, uh, moving in our direction. And I think uh, we, we have to realize the extent to which Europe is politically something of a backwater in this period. The power, the great powers of the world are to the East. Um, another problem has been the behavior of the Catholic Church itself uh, and the brutality with which it has uh, repressed dissent. Uh, a classic case would be the case of Jan Hus, uh, who was invited to the uh, Co Council of Constance in 1450. He says, please come talk to us. Oh, yes, uh, you have safe passage. Oh, no, sorry about that. We're going to burn you at the stake, um, which sets off a rebellion in Czechoslovakia for the better part of the next, uh, of the next century. Um, and finally, uh, the, uh, the point in which the Reformation breaks out uh, you have a new emperor who's going to be elected. It's Charles V. He's a teenager. He doesn't know German. And he's supposed to rule a German empire. So again, the princes of Germany are saying, what are we going to do with this? Uh, and all of a sudden, Martin Luther goes and nails the 95 Theses uh, to the uh, church door. And uh, there's a great scholarly debate. Did he really nail them up or did he uh, just send them to his printer? And I think that nowadays we believe that he did both. <laughs> and, but Frederick of Saxony looks at this and says, you know, this is the kind of challenge to the established order, the challenge to the idea of purgatory, um, that we can build our political challenges to the Holy Roman Empire around. Mm -hmm. uh, so we add all those things together. I mean, it's like any kind of disruption. There's not going to be a single cause. There are going to be some deep underlying causes and some more immediate ones. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the main figures in Protestant Reformation, would you say that their ideas stemmed for the kinds of, from the sort of political and social context they lived in back then? Yes, they do. Well, we start with Martin Luther. Um, and his opposition to the idea of purgatory. And of course, uh, what the Catholic Church had done is it created sort of a European Union of purgatorial prayer, uh, whereby you know, in order to get your family members out of this really horrible situation waiting to go to heaven, I mean, Dante's version of uh, purgatory in the Divine Comedy is, is the nice one where you're simply bored. Uh, the you know, there are other versions which involve uh, people being tortured and you know stuffed in the mouths of cats and things like that, whatever. Um, and so uh, Luther coming along and saying there is no scriptural evidence for this whatsoever. That the economy of the church built on um, indulgences is bogus uh, was a huge point. Uh, his point that to restore Christianity to what it should be, in his view, uh, is a process of rereading and analyzing the text that um, this had begun with in his own generation, uh, you know, people beginning to question uh, very seriously uh, the validity of the traditional translation of the Bible, uh, uh, textual criticism, uh, new um, I mean, Erasmus of Rotterdam, a major figure. I mean, he didn't support Luther in any way, but his own ideas about uh, re-editing uh, Christian scripture were very important because they called into question uh, whether or not what we believe today is something we should be believing. Um, and then around Luther, uh, there were people who were more radical, John Calvin being perhaps the most uh, important of them, taking the idea of predestination from Luther and turning it into the sort of centerpiece of a society of the elect and we're better than everybody else. Uh, but Calvin also 
uh, was much more political um, and raised questions about uh, whether or not uh, royal authority was absolute, whether there was a divine right of kings. Luther never questioned that. Luther stayed politically fairly squarely in the center. Um, when you get over to, I mean, he was supported by Frederick of Saxony uh, and uh, princes of southern Germany. Now, he's not going to rock that boat. And he's too smart for that. Uh, but when you get over to England, you know, you've got a king who's got plenty of problems in Henry VIII, uh, but and who decides he needs a divorce because he needs an heir because he knows he's the son of a usurper. Uh, but the break with Rome uh, is really engineered uh, by Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell, uh, who create a less extreme form of Protestantism that Henry can latch on to and allows that to spread. And Elizabeth I, after the reign of her sister, it's Elizabeth who again creates a more centralist form of Protestantism, which takes on some aspects of Catholicism, um, you know, the, as you can still see in the Church of England today, uh, not rejecting everything that's in the past, but make, creating a path for a national church. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, you know, William of Orange, a really interesting uh, character as well, uh, uh, is able to adapt the more radical forms of Protestantism to support a political order um, against uh, the power of uh, the power of Spain. Um, so, a lot of people working in different ways, and in a sense, what they're all doing is reacting against. Uh, the doctrines of uh, the church, uh, of the Catholic Church in that period, and its alliance to the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, and w what would you say were the main changes that the Protestant Revolution, uh, the, the Protestant Reformation, sorry, brought with it to European nations? Well, I think first of all uh, is the idea that belief should be based on rationality. It is not something that is dictated from above. That Luther's uh, point that, I'm sorry it's not in scripture, um, therefore we will reach the following conclusions. Uh, I mean, they're great Catholic thinkers uh, in the same period, like Galileo, but their work becomes popularized actually in Protestant uh, countries. Uh, the idea that you can be uh, independent, uh, that there's an intellectual world that is independent of the church, uh, that is freed, of the, uh, is freed from the church, uh, that a state can be based on conscience. I mean, this was uh, a critical uh, point in the middle of the 16th century. Uh, whatever, the, whatever the faith of the prince, that's the faith of the people. Uh, you know, today that sounds a bit top down, but the idea that you that there's a choice out there um, is really big. It opens up uh, by breaking down older institutions, new ways of doing business. Uh, you know, I don't think it's at all accidental that you suddenly find uh, the beginnings of capitalism uh, in England, in the Netherlands, uh, that you have uh, really much stronger. Uh, commercial institutions, a uh, much greater sense of experimentation, that it, this is all fueled, I think, uh, by the Reformation. So the growth of the European nation state uh, is a direct result of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of our conversation, I asked you about revolution. So let's talk now about a couple of examples of actual political revolution. So we have the American and the French Revolution. What would you say are some of the biggest differences between them? I think the biggest difference is the practicality of the American reformers versus the ideology of the French reformers. Now, the American Revolution, of course, began as a revolt against big government and ended up with a constitution that created a strong national government. Uh, the leadership there came from uh, former officers of the Continental Army. I mean, uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton, when he wasn't singing and dancing, uh, was an aide to General Washington. You know, uh, Madison 
again, the really significant thinkers driving the structure of the U.S. Constitution, former officers of the Continental Army. Um, it's very important that George Washington was president of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, he was somebody who's used to bringing these people together and working with each other. <clears throat> the leaders of the French Revolution, of course, had, um, well, I should say another thing is that the experience of dealing with the Articles of Confederation, um, et cetera, had given people the notion that they needed to figure out how to compromise to get ahead. That's a word that is not found in the French Revolution um, <laughs> at all. Uh, leaders of the French Revolution had really no experience working together at a national level. Uh, many of them are journalists and lawyers. Um, they're very well read, very eloquent and really very uninterested in compromise. Now, uh, they see ideological correctness as a national, as a necessary aspect of uh, success, no matter how much harm it's going to cause. Uh, ideological litmus tests drove the anti-monarchical movement to extremes. And while the Americans are able to experiment with many of the same ideas, the notion of a civil society based on the consent of the governed, uh, the need of a balance of powers to ensure the stability of government. Uh, French revolutionaries um, are driven really to stake out ever more extreme positions on the grounds that this will help them create a virtuous society. And if you don't want to be virtuous, uh, we have a wonderful new piece of technology, uh, the guillotine, that can take care of that for you. So would you say that because of these differences, they would explain some of the way, some of the different ways American and French societies got organized after the, their respective revolutions? Yes, I think that is the case. I mean, um, there was, of course, in the American colonies, a certain experience of democracy, uh, but the framers of the Constitution didn't trust it very much, um, whereas in the in France, there had been no real prior uh, experience of participatory democracy. And when you suddenly tell people, oh, you can vote and this is going to change things and oh, it doesn't change anything right now, um, there, there was a lot of sort of undermining of uh, the idea of democracy when you made claims to people who had never voted and never participated in something. Uh, about what was going to happen and well no actually what it means we had a really bad harvest and the weather is terrible and you know we can't do things so there was a, a lot of uh, you know the, the lack of experience and organization on the part of the French revolutionaries I think contrasts with uh, the practical experience of the Americans in that in that regard and the ideas of the promises they're making what they expect to see come out of it um, and it's all part of the uh, of the same sort of uh, same sort of issue. Uh, you know, the people, you know, interestingly, Lafayette uh, had actually played a role in the anti-monarchical movement early on. Now, this is a guy who really knows what revolution is supposed to look like. Tom Paine is a member of the National Convention in France before Robespierre threw him into prison because he was too much of a centrist. Uh, and if you in the United States, if you'd seen Tom Paine is in the center. You know, the most radical anti-government thinker you can find. Uh, but maybe his career in the French Revolution sums up the difference uh, as well as anything between uh, what was happening in North America and what would happen in France. Yeah. Uh, okay, so more recently, from an historical perspective, what would be some other examples of things or phenomena that, you would, uh, that would fit the definition of disruption? Well, I think that the most uh, obvious of these really is the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. I mean, when you look at how the Bolshevik Revolution took place, I mean, Lenin wasn't living in Russia, famously, when the Tsarist regime was overthrown. I mean, the Bolshevik movement, I mean, Stalin was in, a, was in prison. Pity he got out again. But uh, um, this was really the ultimate fringe uh, political movement that you could find on the Russian uh, political spectrum, but because of Lenin's uh, ability to seize a slogan, to seize the moment, um, and the uh, lack of ability of Kerensky and his 
uh, follow and his colleagues to actually understand what they were in or the moment they're in. If you're losing a war, what you should do is get out of it. And Kerensky is saying that, oh, no, we're going to continue the war and continue to observe the treaties um, with our allies in the West. And there's uh, Lenin sitting over there saying, you know, uh, peace and land to everybody. Peace, land, bread. Uh, far, far more effective. Uh, and then result of the Bolshevik takeover, and you have a completely different uh, political system, a completely different I mean, system of government, a completely different group of people taking charge. Uh, and I think that if Marx had seen what was going on uh, in the 1920s, he would have looked, oh, well, I, that's a bit interesting. 1930s, he would have been appalled at somebody, you know, that Stalin could take power. Uh, but Stalin stood at the head of a group of people within the Communist Party uh, who were new members who had not had the kind of education that Lenin had had. I mean, one of the uh, difficulties of this book is realizing um, how many of these figures were actually classicists. Uh, I mean, Lenin had a good classical education, as did Marx. Uh, but uh, uh, Stalin you know, stands at the uh, head of people who have very much less education um, and are willing to buy into his series of lies um, in order to create uh, a new Soviet a new Soviet Union on top of the Russian Revolution. Um, I think that, uh, again, the rise of Hitler uh, is the same uh, is the same sort of thing. I mean, you have a basically very conservative style of aristocratic government in Germany that has been there, you know, since the formation of uh, the German state. Uh, and the kind of populist, I mean, Hindenburg had no idea what he was getting into with Hitler. Uh, he said, oh, I can just control this guy. Uh, he didn't recognize that I mean, Hitler's control of media that he couldn't imagine, I mean, that Hitler's flying around Germany addressing uh, mass rallies, uh, is much more uh, in tune with uh, film, with radio, that Again, the thorough disruption of German political society uh, very rapidly by uh, a populist movement in Nazism is another uh, kind of change uh, of that sort. And we can, I think, contrast that, for instance, um, with, say, uh, Deng sets China on a new course, but it's still a course uh, that's dominated by the Communist Party. Um, the fall of the Soviet Union, well, um, we still got pretty much the same people in charge there. I think that was a, a good point of contrast with what we saw um, in the first part of the century. Mm -hmm. But are there any good examples of contemporary phenomena, particularly in Western countries, that you would say uh, we could classify as disruptions or that could lead to disruptions? I think that we should be very cautious uh, about this. Um, I think that we can look around us at the rise of uh, differing populist movements, which are based um, on fantasies about uh, immigration. Um, and of course, in this country, fantasies about all uh, manner of uh, of things in the wake of the last presidential election, uh, that we are certainly seeing a widespread loss of faith in traditional institutions, uh, that the circumstances which could lead to a major disruption are out there today. Um, we haven't seen the kind of radical disruption that I've been talking about in, in the past, since the end of World War II. Uh, but we're also uh, looking at a, a situation uh, where political movements, which are really uh, substantially opposed to ideas of, lit of liberal democracy, are gaining power in a wide range of places. And there is also, frankly, a failure of government to stand up uh, to monopoly capitalism 
which has a vested interest in uh, enriching uh, very few at the expense of the great number of people. People are watching their jobs being swallowed by Amazon on a, on a daily basis. Uh, what is government's responsibility here? I mean, in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, uh, you know, the United States passed antitrust laws. We seem to have forgotten them uh, in the era of, of Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google, and Apple. Uh, so I think we, we do need to be uh, really aware of the presence of the underlying situation of distrust in institutions uh, around us today. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about disruptions, we can't say that they are always good or bad or necessary, right? I think it depends. Um, a disruption will bring new order to a chaotic situation. Uh, Abdel Malik's creation of an Islamic state after you know, it looked like uh, the potential of the uh, Islamic state could fall apart into civil wars uh, is a very, on the basis of uh, the teachings of Muhammad, the framing of the U.S. Constitution is um, a, are signs of disruptions which are very good. I think the Protestant Reformation Another example of a disruption that was very good. Um, but there is no way of knowing exactly what the end is going to be, even if you follow Lenin's advice and make sure you're surrounded by people who will think the way you do. Um, you know, I certainly don't think anybody could say that the ultimate, you know, what was happening in France, France in 1793 and 1794 was a good disruption. Um, it created misery for the vast majority of people. Uh, it led to decades of war. Uh, again, the Bolshevik Revolution uh, leading to Stalinism. That's not um, a, good, uh, a good disruption or the rise of the Nazis. Uh, it, it really does depend. All of these are radical changes. Some of them work for the good, but you have to know what you're doing in order for that to happen. You have to be really have a sense that you're in this situation in the first place. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, the kind of approach you present in the book, in what ways would you say it's different from other approaches we see in history to understand these kinds of phenomena and what new insights does it give us? Well, I'd like to think that what you what you have to be able to do, as I think, is to recognize what is happening in the world around you at the present moment. We have a tendency to, to, to think in terms of there are broad economic forces. There's economic dislocation. This must mean something. No, it doesn't. It means there's economic dislocation. It does not mean that there's a set conclusion. And I think that the importance of what I'm trying to argue for is that when you're in a situation of loss of trust in institutions, contingent circumstance matters. The choices that people make, the choices that leaders make, the way they try to reach out, that is what is going to determine the end. If you can go and reestablish a new center that can bring people together, that is a very positive form of disruption. If you don't do that, if you insist on moving uh, to one extreme or another, that can be an extremely damaging kind of disruption. The idea here is that if you can look at what is successful or unsuccessful, hopefully what you can do uh, is avoid uh, the worst forms of disruption uh, and create a new common ground uh, that will help people come together and will hopefully uh, create a dialogue, um, create policies uh, which are going to be good for everybody. Uh, so that's why I think that combining a sense of the you know, big uh, socioeconomic forces and changes with contingent circumstance that leads to a specific end, uh, I think sets the approach of this book apart uh, from a lot of other uh, not work that I, I genuinely admire, but um, I think that 
those who work on great forces and those who work on contingent circumstance don't always talk to each other. And that's the conversation I'm trying to get started here. <laughs> okay. And do you think we can understand better contemporary political and social phenomena with your approach? Do, can we, for example, predict disruptions? Um, I think that we can predict the possibility at the present time, I think we can predict the possibility of, of disruption. What we've seen um, in the, what we're seeing in the United States right now, uh, the inability of two parties to speak to each other, uh, what we saw in the UK with a Brexit vote that was based on a, a series of lies um, and uh, the installation of a government whose uh, level of competence is um, I don't want to be unkind about other people's government, but I, th I think you know what I'm saying. Um, that what we've, uh, you know, what we're seeing are signs that our own institutions aren't working very well. You know, if you can have somebody elected president of the United States who's never held any kind of elective office uh, and is mostly notable for real estate bankruptcies, um, again, somebody with minimal uh, capacity as Prime Minister uh, of England, uh, what we can see in Central Europe. Again, I think are some very troubling uh, regimes uh, which are not really, Orban's hunt is not really in tune with the spirit of the European Union. Um, so I think that we can see that we're on the edge of something uh, which could potentially lead to severe disruption and that hopefully what uh, leadership will recognize is what their responsibility is to undo this situation, to make things better for other people, uh, to look hard at the causes of the unhappiness and of the misery uh, that people are, uh, are suffering and have been uh, now for really the better part of a decade, uh, even back before 2008 and nine. Uh, income growth was slowing, access to education was not expanding, uh, healthcare systems were not uh, working to the best interests of people. Um, so how do we, um, when we see what's going on um, and, and realize that it is up to us now to find a solution, I hope that this book um, will show people that it's their responsibility to do this. They cannot rely on some impersonal great force from uh, somewhere else to do it for them. <laughs> okay, so just one last question. If we know how disruptions work, should we try to prevent them? Is that something you would be interested in? I, not entirely sure because, you know, a good disruption could be a good, uh, yeah. if we don't look to Bolshevism, we look, say, to the, you know, the process of creating a constitution in the United States or the uh, Protestant Reformation uh, or the way Abd al-Malik uh, recreated an Islamic state, uh, that these are all very positive things. Uh, and so we should look at how to use the moment in a positive way uh, to create a stronger structure um, in place of structures that are failing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the book is again Disruption, Why Things Change. So, Dr. Potter, apart from the book, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Yes, I think you can um, order it, uh, certainly through the Oxford University Press uh, these days, through your local bookshop, through Barnes & Noble, not through Amazon. Um, <laughs> And I, and I use your use your local bookseller uh, and place an order, and, and I uh, support your neighbors. Okay, great. So, Dr. Potter, it was it's been a, re a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and me. Thank you, Ricardo. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been posting interviews for the past three years and a half. 
and I need your support to keep the channel running and so please pay a visit to my Patreon page and consider making a pledge there for, a li for as little as $1 a month. Uh, and you also have links to PayPal if you prefer it in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perorga Larsen, Lagurero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Greg Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Klingby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Ginty, Zurtger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinho, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Aubrey Hickson, Fergal Cousin, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, uh, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslam Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Max Bailby, Nelek Back, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lita Cosmides, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardas Franz, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.